the belief in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, is a very important doctrine. And even as we see throughout the land and parts of North America more pressure put upon the church in various areas, um, these cardinal doctrines, these basic truths are gonna need to be held to tenaciously. Um, things are gonna get separated out possibly in the land as far as uh, true believers and those who are but nominal. And so these are, these are essential truths. What is, what is a resurrection? It is to bring back to life something that was dead. When we have a loved one and, and they're in bed, perhaps they're in a hospital and we attend to them and we are there when they breathe their last and we have been attentive to them over days, perhaps weeks, perhaps even months. And then when they do breathe their last and have that death rattle sometimes or that final, sometimes there's a final surge and then before they leave this world and then they expire out that last breath and then they no longer breathe again, uh, we are certain that they are gone. We know that they are not there anymore, that it's just the shell of the person at that point. And then they are sent to the, the funeral home and they lay them out in a coffin and we come perhaps for a visitation and for a funeral, sometimes it's an open coffin and we look upon that loved one of ours and we know that they are gone. It is certain that they are gone. It's a certainty. They're cold, they're lifeless, you can touch them if you wish, but they'll be cold and they will not respond. You can talk to them if you wish, but there will be no response back. The few raisings from the dead in the scriptures that we have were attended with great amazement because this was a miracle not often seen and it was an impossibility. What is a resurrection? It's to bring back from the dead someone to life. And the belief that Christ was raised from the dead is a test of orthodoxy. It's a test of our faith and whether or not we are in the faith. It's a condition for salvation, for church membership, for Christian fellowship. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is not enough to believe in a historic Jesus. It's not enough to believe in a historic Jesus who lived a good life and died a horrible death. We have to believe in the resurrection from the dead, otherwise his good life and his horrible death has no real meaning to it. Because the stated goal of Christianity is that this earth, God's good earth, would one day be cleaned off and that there will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven to God are the elect of God who have been made righteous by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and by his perfect life, who will dwell upon the earth and the wicked shall be no more upon this earth. The stated goal of Christianity is nothing less than a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And the one who is the leader of all of that is the one who leads with a scepter of righteousness, who has joy above his fellows because of his righteousness. And so the resurrection of Christ is very, very important. And as I was musing on these things this year, as we do this each year, I thought about the fact that there has to be a witness of death before you can have a witness of resurrection. That the witnesses in the scriptures, they were witnessed not only of his resurrection in the empty tomb, but they witnessed the actual expiring of the Lord Jesus Christ, the death of Christ. And they had seen this before John eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus says to his disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead. I've talked about him sleeping, talking metaphorically, he's dead. 
John eleven thirty nine. 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was, that was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been in the grave four days. She was certain that he was dead. She was certain that he was gone. Everybody was certain that he was gone. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with grave clothes and his face bound with a napkin. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. They knew Lazarus was dead. And therefore, the resurrection was certified. It was certified. And when Jesus died, he did not die in a corner. As Paul said to the magistrates, this thing was not done in a corner. Jesus died, as Brother David dealt with last Sunday morning, it was a public affair, witnessed by hundreds, if not thousands. He was publicly crucified, he was executed, some watched part of the execution, some watched all of the execution to its very conclusion. It was the time of the Passover. The city was teeming with humanity. We were walking down in Seattle and it's like all other cities, you know. It teems with humanity. Well, the city of Jerusalem was teeming with humanity at that time in which Christ was crucified. And he was crucified, as David dealt with last week, along a public road. It was a public road so that there were many passerbys. In Matthew 27, 39, and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. So it was wide open. It was in an open place and it was on a public road for everyone to see. And the religious leadership witnessed his death too. Likewise, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders. And I assure you, many of them stayed for the whole event. They wanted to see and be sure that this man finally was expired. He was finally gone. Matthew 26, 62 says, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together to Pilate and said, sir, we remember that deceiver said when he was still alive, after three days I would rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure till the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead and the last heir shall be worse than the first. So lots of instruction there. They were listening to the words of Christ. They understood better the words of Christ than the disciples did at times. They were worried about it. And they're going to try to make a sepulcher sure. If he's a deceiver, why do you need to make a sepulcher sure? Well, the disciples might play a trick. Pilate said, you have a watch, go your way. Make it as sure as you can. A great phrase. <laughs> make it as sure as you can. So these... Chief priests, scribes, elders, Pharisees, Sadducees, they witnessed his death. They saw the death. And all this is necessary because it certifies the resurrection. Mark 15. Well, Matthew 27, 47, some of them that stood there when they heard that, they said, this man calls for Elias. So you had passerbys and then you had those who stood there. You had those who were a part of a big crowd that watched. Mark 15, 40, there were also women looking on afar off, among whom Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the last and of Joseph, Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered to him, and many other women which came up with him into Jerusalem. We know there was a large group of women who ministered to his needs while he was here upon the earth, and they were there, and they were there for the whole affair, and they stayed to the end. And they witnessed the death of Jesus Christ. In Luke 23, 26. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country. On him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. So there was a great company of people following him to the place of execution. Luke 23, 48, and all the people that came together to that site 
beholding the things that were done, they smote their breasts and returned and all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee stood afar off and they beheld these things. So it was all of these women and then it says also all his acquaintance were there as well. So this was a large group of witnesses who were witnessing the death of Jesus Christ and watching him expire. You know, we sometimes talk about the fact, we, we talk about John and uh, Mary and some of the women who were close up to the cross. And at times men say that they were the only ones there, where were the other disciples? Well, it's very possible that the other disciples were among the great crowd as well, who had walked with him all those years too, who were watching to see the event. It would be hard for me to believe that there were none of them there. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Even as you have families gather together at times when there is family available for the execution of a prisoner, even in our day or in days past as well, or public hangings, if you've ever seen the pictures of them, it often drew large crowds to watch that event. This, grew, this drew a large crowd. Both of those who were strangers, part of the Passover, as well as those who were acquaintance and who knew Christ, both of men, both of women as well. But they came to see. John 19.31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation, the special circumstances around the Passover certified the death of Jesus Christ. Sometimes they could stay on the cross for long periods of time, for days on end, and suffer up there. But we know in this, because the Sabbath day was coming, it was a high day, they besought Pilate that the legs would be broken so that they could be taken off and taken away and not be up there during the Sabbath. And so they came to break the legs so that they could no longer push up on the little stoop that was there to give themselves another breath. And when they did that, they came to break the lives of the two thieves, one who would perish forever in hell, one who would be in paradise that day. And they came to the Lord Jesus Christ. It says they broke the legs of the first and of the other, crucified with him. They took care of those two first. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was dead already. They certified it. And these were men who knew what death was. They had been around this. They had been a part of this. No doubt some of these soldiers had a special part in the army that this was part of their duty. And Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went boldly to Pilate, craved the body of Jesus, and Pilate marveled if he was already dead. This was unusual. And calling unto him the centurion asked him, whether he had been any, any while dead. And when he knew, of the, knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. The centurion, who was the head of the men who were around that place, said, yes, he is dead. And he marveled that he could be dead so quickly. You know why? <laughs> because he, Christ was in charge of the situation. <laughs> Nobody took his life. He gave it up. So what is a resurrection? It's bringing back to life something that was dead. And what is a witness? A witness is somebody who has seen something or heard something or handled something or tasted something or smelled something. It's somebody who has used their senses firsthand and they're giving a witness and a testimony what they saw, heard, tasted, touched firsthand. What kind of witnesses do we accept as credible? We have to have what we call credible witnesses. Well, we don't allow or we didn't allow in this country at times certain people because of criminal backgrounds uh, to be a witness, uh, to give testimony. They were not considered credible. Well, we have here many credible witnesses. First of all, it's firsthand testimony. Jesus answered and said to them, go your way, tell John the things that you saw and heard. 
the blind see, just tell them what you saw and you heard. That's a credible witness. It's what you see and what you hear. Christ said, verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you don't receive our witness. Christ said, I have been with the Father. I am from the Father. He was testifying firsthand and they rejected that testimony. So just because men have firsthand testimony and are credible witnesses doesn't mean that people will necessarily believe them, okay? There's something else that has to be there. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Thomas, except I shall see in his hands. <laughs> You've had firsthand witness, he would be rebuked for that, but what Thomas was saying is, I want to see it. First hand. Acts 4.20, in their preaching, they said, we cannot but speak of the things which we have seen and heard. These were, men of, these were men who were there firsthand. And you know that the apostles were those who only who had been with Jesus the whole time and up to and saw his death and resurrection. That was a requirement to be an apostle. That's what they preached. They just preached what they saw and what they heard. The witnesses also, what kind of witnesses do we accept as credible? They have to be witnesses who are not gullible, not easily persuaded. And these witnesses were not easily persuaded. Mark 16, 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, whom he had cast devils out. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept, and they, when they had heard he was alive, they didn't believe it. These were not gullible men. These were not men easily persuaded at all. Mark 16, 12, after that he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked, went into the country, and as they went, they went to the residue. We have this account, we don't have this account in Luke. Luke has the larger account. But here, Mark tells us that these two on the road to Emmaus came back and told the others what happened. And their response was, is we don't believe it. These were not gullible men. These were not men who were easily convinced of something. And Thomas, of course, also. So a credible witness is someone who's not gullible. They're not easily persuaded. They want to see it and hear it for themselves. And they are witnesses who have an abundance of evidence. If they have an abundance of evidence, that makes them a better witness. In John 20 and 26, after eight days, the disciples were within. Thomas was with them. And then came Jesus. The doors were shut. He stood in the midst. Peace be to you. Thomas, he says to Thomas, reach your hand. Behold my hands. Reach your hand, thrust it into my side. Pulls away the robe where the spear was. Be not faithless, but believing, Thomas answered, my Lord and my God. He's a witness. Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have seen and yet not believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. Many other signs. So these were witnesses... <laughs> who had an abundance of evidence concerning the Lord. We are given, we're given all we need, but they were given even more. They would have to die for Christ. These witnesses had a lot to lose by bearing testimony too. If you have a witness who has a lot to lose, and but they're still bearing testimony, it adds to the credibility of the witness. We have a witness protection program where somebody is going to witness, perhaps it's against a drug lord or someone else who might take revenge on them. And so we have a whole special part of law enforcement, a witness protection program by which they will you know, swoop these witnesses away, take them to an undisclosed location so that they are not killed before they bear witness. And then perhaps relocate them to another part of the country to where they cannot be found, hopefully. Why? because we want them to witness. Why do we want them to witness? Because we assume that if they have a lot to lose, they're gonna tell the truth. 
They don't have any advantage in telling a lie. Well, Paul said, what things were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, of everything. It cost the apostles a lot to bear witness to what they had seen and heard. And Paul said, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. The afflictions of the gospel is the fact that these witnesses are going to have to pay something for the witness. It makes them a credible witness. And the apostles had witnessed Christ's resurrection recently. <laughs> Not 30 years ago. You know, when we have trials and things are brought up about somebody from 30 years ago, that makes it very hard. Very hard. But the testimony of these men was the testimony of something that they had seen presently in their own lifetime. In fact, when we have the, the witness of the 500 that's talked about by the Apostle Paul, he said there were 500, over 500 that had, were witness, and he said, and most of them are still alive. So that you can go to them, you can ask them, they could be questioned at this time what they saw, what they heard. It was credible. Who witnessed the resurrection of Christ? Well, the 500 did. That's part of it. And the scripture teaches in Deuteronomy and in Matthew as well, in a court of law, two or three witnesses establish a matter. So in Deuteronomy, two or three witnesses establish a matter. And then that comes back in Matthew 18 to church courts as well. When you have discipline cases, two or three witnesses establish a matter. Well, we have more than two or three witnesses to establish this matter. And it would have been better for Peter to keep quiet and not expose his own faults, which are going to be exposed by his own following of Jesus Christ and bearing testimony to Jesus Christ, which faults are plainly given out in the gospel. And yet we find Peter, Acts 2.32, this Jesus hath God raised from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses, Peter says. The apostles were called to be witnesses of the resurrection, Acts 1.21 Wherefore, of these men which have accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord went in and went out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of the resurrection. We have to be with him from the time of the baptism to the ascension in order to be an apostle so that we can bear witness. But what we're bearing witness to specifically and most importantly is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because this is the foundation of the new heaven and the new earth. This is the accomplishment of salvation, the vindication by God. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. They, they were witnesses first of his death, and then of his resurrection, to certify that resurrection. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to those that obey him. Two witnesses. We are the witnesses, and the Holy Ghost witnesses to these things. The Holy Scripture does. And this is part of what we need to understand. As I lay out the information of what is a credible witness, two or three establish a matter, we've got more than two or three, and yet you can establish all these things and can give you all these matters, but there has to be the witness of the Holy Ghost in the soul. And then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, Matthew 28, end of Matthew, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. He had appointed a place to meet them after he would be raised from the dead. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. And some doubted. These were not men that were easily convinced. 
And Jesus came and spoke to them, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go and teach the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teach them to observe everything I have commanded. I'll be with you always to the end of the world. Witness of the angels. When they came to the tomb, the angels spoke to the women and they said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when you were in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And so when angelic beings bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they quote the scriptures. They quote the Lord Jesus Christ. The angels don't have any special message to bring, some unusual message from the angels. The angels give exactly what Christ gave. We have over 500 disciples seeing the risen Christ, and then we have the half-brother of James, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. After that, he was seen of James, and then of the apostles. The half-brother of James, who was very skeptical about his half-brother Christ, along with the other half-brothers, who were very skeptical about this, that he was, whether he was the Messiah or not. Here we have this half-brother now bearing witness to the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ as well. A change had been made. John went in, he saw the empty tomb. Peter went in, he saw the empty tomb. Matthew gives testimony to it in his gospel. Mark gives testimony in his gospel. John gives testimony in his gospel. Paul the apostle, a brilliant, capable, rational intellect, saw him last of all offering his witness of the event as well. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, last of all, he was seen of me as of one born out of due time. That he saw Christ on the road to Damascus. Barnes writes, the resurrection of Christ was a fact to be proved, like all other facts, by competent and credible witnesses. Paul therefore appeals to the witnesses who had attested or who yet lived to attest the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and shows it was not possible that so many witnesses should have been deceived. Do you believe the many witnesses of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Scriptures themselves are the most reliable ancient book in the world. As far as the manuscripts that we have and the discrepancies among them which make no alteration in any significant doctrine at all. It's better than Homer's Iliad, it's better than Shakespeare, it's better than any of the ancient writings. We have a reliable witness of the death, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why has this one book been preserved better than any ancient book? The resurrection of Christ is one of the most attested to facts in the ancient world by credible men. Does that mean that if we present the facts logically, as we were trying to do this morning, we will get a positive response for Christ? And the answer is no, which is at times astonishing to our own hearts. But the Spirit of God must illuminate the mind. The Spirit of God must regenerate the soul, it has to bring life. The same life that brought Christ from the dead has to bring us from the dead. It's the only way that we can believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in his ascension. Despite the fact that all these credible witnesses are brought forth of both his death and his life, he must convict and convince the soul of its own native bigotry against God and against the church and against Christ. The unbelieving chief priests, scribes, and elders witnessed the death and had firsthand testimony from the soldiers of what happened there. And Christ was gone. And they held down the truth in unrighteousness. They had seen the life of Christ. They had seen the miracle of the, rais of the rising of Lazarus. 
But the native mind and heart of man is so full of bigotry against God and against his Christ that all they could do is do it all within their power to try to stop the influence. And so they paid the soldiers large sums of money. Actually, Judas Iscariot got a raw deal in the amount of money that he was given to betray Christ in comparison to the soldiers, but that's because Judas had had somewhat of an influence of Christ upon his own soul, and the soldiers didn't necessarily, so what they were going to get, they're going to get a bigger and better bargain to keep their mouth shut. And if it came to the governor that they had not done their duty and that they deserved death, we'll take care of that too. It's called the deep state. Well, the disciples themselves could not believe without the illumining work of God's Spirit. Their words, the scripture says, seemed like idle tales when they heard about the resurrection. Peter himself, it says, wondered in himself when he stood there in the empty tomb. They knew what the tomb was, they knew where the tomb was, they knew who was in the tomb. They had, the women had prepared spices to come back to the tomb. And it says about these two on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And they said, but we had trusted that it had been he which would have redeemed Israel, but we must have been wrong. And the women came and said these things and it made us astonished, but we don't know what to make of it. It amazed us. The Greek word is it amazed us. We were out of our wits. We were besides ourselves with this information that was given to us. And then certain of them that went with us to the sepulcher found it as the women had said, but him they didn't see. They didn't see him. So every possible doubt that's possible to doubt, they doubted. And it says in Luke 24 and 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Christ gave an exposition to them in all of the scriptures about himself. In verse 31, and their eyes were opened. And that's not just because of a logical portrayal of facts. Their eyes were opened because the Spirit of God opened their eyes. And when they had thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. And they were terrified, and they were afraid, and they thought that they had seen a spirit. And then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So my prayer is this morning is that the Holy Spirit will open the understanding. Open your understanding. Give understanding there. Just my piling up witnesses is not enough. It's not. You kind of think that, you know, and and you get used to, as a believer, having this light that's been given to you, and you'd think at times, and I've heard many of believers say, why don't they believe? I, I can show them this, and I can show them that. But there has to be this opening of the understanding. We especially need the witness of the Spirit of God. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for me, for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But if I depart, I'll send him. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because we find it difficult to face the truth of ourselves. We easily condemn others, but hide from the mirror ourselves about who we are. Of righteousness, Christ's righteousness as the only acceptable righteousness to meet God with because we go about trying to establish our own righteousness. And of judgment because we must be convinced that the world, our flesh, and the devil all conspire to deceive us into admiring their unity against the Christ. And yet they are all wrong And the prince of this world, the devil, was stripped of his power at the cross. And therefore, he no longer overawes Christians whom he once dominated. 
But it's difficult for us to believe that how could everyone else be wrong? How is that possible? How is it possible that the majority of the world is wrong? I was reading a report from a missionary from Taiwan, and they were talking about the church there, the need for leadership, the need for discipleship. And what they said was that after 200 years of evangelistic ministry there in Taiwan, uh, the, the, the Buddhists were at 95%. Um, trying to think of who the other group was, but then the believers were at 0.65% after 200 years. And so the Holy Spirit has to bring us out of this illusion that the majority is right. Because the majority of the world does not believe this. No matter how much information you give them. So that we are cast upon God and we are cast upon the work of the Holy Spirit once again. To come and to illuminate and change men's hearts. And give men a love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And a belief, a true belief. Not just in a historic Jesus. But in the reality of what his life mission was. The reality of his perfections. The reality that he was God. God and man. The reality that this is the purpose and plan of God from all of the ages to accomplish, and it was accomplished then and there, and its ongoing effects are going on in the world, and that he is gathering in his elect. Could his elect be that few in that country? Indeed, it is according to the will and purpose of God, whatever the amount of the elect is. We know at the last day there will be a number which no man could number. But we have to be convinced that God be true and every man a liar. So do you believe in the many witnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection? And what is the result of believing in the resurrection of Christ? Well, if we believe in the resurrection of Christ, if we believe in the reality of what was going on there and and in the resurrection, we believe that God was pleased with the work of his son on the cross. We believe that this is a vindication. We believe that what Christ was doing there on a cross was not a martyrdom. It was an atonement. It was an accomplishing of salvation and a bringing forth of this, this new kingdom of God. We believe that his death and subsequent resurrection was the first fruits of all who die in Jesus. We believe that the goal of Christianity is to populate the world with believers alone who will glorify God in the end. We believe that the foundation for success in that goal is established right there at the witness of his death and then the witness of his resurrection. And it is a doctrine of power. Paul, when he speaks of the faith of the Ephesians, Ephesians 1.15, and we'll close with this. Go to Ephesians 1 and 15. He says, wherefore I also, after I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Because that's what we have to have. You know, when you boil it all down, when you look at this world and when you look at our country and you look at trends and you look at the way things go and you look at how believers suffer throughout the world, at the end of the day, the most important thing is whether or not we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have revealed to us the greatness of his person. Because at the end of the day, they take everything from Christians except Christ. They take away their jobs, they take away their families, they take away their life, they take away pleasures, any pleasures upon the earth. They throw them in prisons. They do all these things. And yet the believers persevere in their belief because the most important thing is that in my soul, I have by the Holy Ghost shed abroad in my soul the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, we go about our day. We don't know what will come in this country. We don't borrow trouble for tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. All I know is that in our country, there's a lot of nominal Christianity. There's no doubt about that. In which people just go to church for lots of different reasons. But at the end of the day, you know, what goes on in my soul toward the Lord Jesus Christ is the reality of my faith. Not any facade I put on for the church. At the end of the day, my relationship to the living God through Jesus Christ is what is important in my life. Everything's important, and our jobs are important, and our family's important, all that is important. But the first and foremost among all of that is whether or not I have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. And Paul says that the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, God's calling, and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The result of believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a doctrine of power. It's a doctrine of love in that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart, but it's a doctrine of power. The exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. That we don't have to sit back as though we are helpless as though we are helpless against sin and Satan and the flesh and the world, we're not helpless against any of those things. We have working in us the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So there's no excuse for our sins as much as we would like to have an excuse for our sins. Because God's power to us word is infinite. Therefore, as we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You know, the coronavirus, the pressure against Christians, the lawsuits against Christians, the trying to shut down of Christian schools, all these things that we fight, they all have a blessed effect upon us. They strip away, they strip away all the things that we think are so important. And they bring us back to that one important thing. Mary sitting at the feet of Christ, listening to him. She has chosen the better part. We get all this stripped away. And what I want is that from day to day, our daily life, we would concentrate again in our relationship to Jesus Christ. Because this affects the way you have a relationship with everybody else yeah. and everything else, whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, whether it's society, whatever it is. But we have to have that soul relationship with Jesus Christ, that true salvation, being a true Christian by which we commune with Christ on a daily basis, on a regular basis, we walk with Christ. We see his providence at work in the world, in our own lives personally. Like we said with David, David was far from God. But when David was brought back to God and he sees the Egyptian in the field, when he goes off to try to find his family that has been stripped from him, he sees the sweet providence of God at work again. You know, do we see it? Do we acknowledge it day by day? Do we offer up the sacrifice of praise to God? Are we acting out our priesthood to God? And I want us to be full of joy because resurrection is life. So the gloominess, we talked about the shadow of death in the Sunday school hour. You know, the gloominess of things that are going on in the world and in the country at this time. I don't want that to steal your joy in the Lord. Set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth, for we are dead and our life is hidden with Christ in God. I read an article on that from one of the Sovereign Grace brothers this week as well. 
There's a command there. We are to set our affections above. That's where our joy is. Yeah. We, can, we can walk in this shadow of death. We see, we understand what's going on around us. But we ultimately have this victory. And this victory is based in and founded by the resurrection of our blessed Lord. To whom anyone whom the Spirit of God has opened this up to, we have no, no one needs to convince us anymore. The Spirit of God has convinced us that he is alive. He is alive and he rules and he reigns. And may he rule and reign in your heart. Father, we thank you for the day. This is the day that you have made. We are glad and we rejoice in it, O Lord. And our words will fall upon deaf ears unless the Spirit of God takes them up and makes them live. And so we pray for that life, that life and that joy in Christ. We pray that you would break through the darkness and bring forth the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, uh, our blessed Savior, who has been so gracious to us to make known to us our own uh, estate, which was ruined in Adam, but which is restored in the second Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would take your word now, you would be glorified with it, and that you would strengthen our hearts uh, in the coming week and day by day, and in the coming service as well. When Brother David comes to bring us the word of life once again, that you would cause this word of life to live in us, to grow in us, and that with a, a childlike simplicity that we would learn to trust you and follow you in all things. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. You are dismissed.